Oh no! Well, it was it was thirty years of crazy events. I was a, um, you know, I had a, a thirty year career. I retired as a as a police captain, but my uh, career spanned everything from undercover narcotics to uh, SWAT team operations, and yeah, no, every, did did a little bit of everything. What was the what was it? What's the story? A crazy story you could tell us that you that would be uh, you know anything stick out to you? Uh, there's probably some statues of limitations I still got to worry about. So. <laughs> that was Bart Lombardo with a little glimpse into his previous life as a police officer. Another overachiever going deep today on Panfish. This is the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how's it going today? Thank you for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. Before we get going, please take a moment and share this episode with uh, one or two other people, maybe three if you get a chance this week. Uh, somebody who wants to get into panfish a little deeper. Uh, not sure if you've uh, had any action as of late, but Bart covers it all. He's got a great resource with uh, tons of flies and, and tips there. So. We're going to dig into that today, but click that uh, share button down in the bottom of your app uh, or on the top or wherever it is and uh, copy that link, send it out in a text or email, and uh, let's, let's help uh, help find another person who needs some, uh, some, uh, <laughs> some sunfish goodness. Bart Lombardo, the panfish guru, is here to break down his top panfish flies and a number of tips to help you get a little more action uh, this year. Bart describes uh, what his triangle fly is all about, this triangle foam fly design. He digs uh, deep into catching panfish in colder environments and then tells us why only crazy people fish during the winter time for panfish. Before we get started, let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. In today's world of mass-produced products, Stonefly Nets has reclaimed the tradition of handcrafted care with their custom wood landing nets. Please head over to wetflyswing.com slash stonefly to get your custom net today. That's wetflyswing.com slash stonefly to get started right now. I've got a good excuse for you to buy another three weight today. So without further ado, here is Bart Lombardo from panfishonthefly.com. How's it going, Bart? It's going well, Dave. Uh, thanks for inviting me on the show. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for coming on. I've been uh, the, the pan fishing has been a topic I've been wanting to uh, you know talk about for a while, and we've had a few listeners recently that have um, mentioned this. I think Will was one person who a while back said, you know, it'd be good to do one of these episodes. And you are the the pan fish specialist with on the fly. So, so we're gonna dig into that today. Before we get there, uh, bring us back to the start. Uh, how you uh, first got into fly fishing. I was probably around uh, 12 years old when I picked up my first fly rod. Um, I had, you know, like most people starting out, you know, you started out uh, spin fishing and, you know, I, I flailed around with a fly rod for all through my teens. And I, I remember catching my first trout on a fly on a family camping trip to uh, Pine Creek in, in Pennsylvania. And I was, I was pretty much hooked at, at that point. I, you know, first got attracted to fly fishing through the, you know, the outdoor magazines of the time, you know, back in the early seventies that, you know, fly fishing was this, you know, kind of this, uh, different way of, of fishing. Yeah. You know, and it was really the, uh, the fish that folks tie, you know, targeted with a, a fly rod, you know, trout and salmon that really initially you know, got me interested in, in fly fishing. And I learned pretty quickly that trout were, uh, you know, they were pretty tough to catch on a fly when you're first starting out. And, you know, that's, that's when I first discovered, uh, you know, the joys of catching panfish on a fly because they are uh, a little bit more forgiving of, of sloppy casts and uh, bad presentations. But my, uh, my fly fishing did continue. Um, when I reached my, my late teens, early twenties, I kind of switched over to a, you know, fly rod exclusively and kind of laid down the spinning rod and used the fly rod to chase just about everything, uh, that, you know, I fished for. And that was the full, so you, and you remind me again, now you're in the, the Northeast. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually in the Northeast. I'm in New Jersey 
and um, but I do uh, I travel all throughout the country to fly fish. I, I spend a lot of time out west each year. I try and get out to uh, you know Montana once a year. Although uh-huh. I have not been out there since uh, yep since COVID. COVID. Yeah, uh, yeah. So there's been a lot of a lot of travel closer to home. Um, you know, throughout the Northeast. Matter of fact, I just got back from a, a land lake salmon trip up in Maine. And, uh, oh, nice. so get, getting around quite a bit. Well, so, and on the panfish on the flight, tell me why, because you could have just, you know, gone out there and fished for panfish. Why, why start a website? What was the, where did that passion come from? So the reason I, um, started panfish on the fly and started promoting fly fishing for panfish was to make fly fishing more accessible to folks. I, became interested in, you know, teaching others how to fly fish, uh, a number of years back. I was uh, heavily involved in, uh, you know, organizations like Trout Unlimited and through Trout Unlimited, we did a lot of instruction to folks getting started in fly fishing. And, uh, it was, you know, it's a challenge to get people to start catching fish right away on a, on a fly rod and discovered early on that, you know, panfish were an opportunity for, you know, people to put a bend in the rod early on. And as I, and when I retired from my, uh, my long career, I was uh, 30 years as a uh, police officer. And when I retired from that, I became more involved in the fly fishing community and, and actually started guiding and doing a little bit more on the instruction side of things. And it was very easy for me to kind of accelerate the learning curve and teaching people how to fly fish by putting them on a warm water pond and having them cast to uh, bluegills and bass, as opposed to getting them out on a trout stream where we had to deal with, uh, you know, fish that kind of dialed in on specific food forms. And then we had the, all the challenges of, of dealing with currents and, and mending and presenting flies and drag free drifts. And we could take a lot of that out of the equation when uh, we're, we, fish for in warm water environments. Yeah. So that is, uh, you know, I mean, that's a great reason to start it. Yeah. You start it for a resource basically to help people, um, maybe you're out there guiding. So now you can direct people your way. And, and it seems like it's one of the, one of the good reasons, you know, obviously when you search panfish on the fly, that one comes up, you've got a good URL for it. Um, I'm curious, I mean, just take us to the panfish. So talk about, you know, why, uh, I mean, I think maybe you just answered it, but why would anybody want to dig into to panfish, you know, because you got all these other species out there. What, what would be, somebody comes to you and they say, yeah, why, why would I want to go panfishing? What would you say? Well, I think the first reason is accessibility. I mean, they, they are everywhere and, you know, I love to fish. I, I, you know, I want to fish as often as I can. And where I'm living here in central New Jersey, we do have some, some quality trout fishing in the state, but that fishing is about an hour and a half away from me. So for you know me to spend a couple hours on a trout stream, it's three hours in a car back and forth just to make that happen. You know, meanwhile, I can walk out my front door and, you know, either be walking to shoreline or, you know, kicking my float tube or paddling my kayak in any number of lakes that are within, you know, it's as little as a, as a five minute ride. And, you know, the, the area that I live in is, you know, relatively rural. It's, um, you know, still kind of a farm country and there are, it's literally dotted with, with lakes and ponds and, and warm water streams. So these, these fish are everywhere. And, and that holds true across the country, whether you're living in a, a rural suburban, even urban environments, you know, with city parks and, uh, you know, waterways that flow through urban areas, they're all predominantly warm water fisheries and these fish they stretch coast to coast uh, you know they're in all of the 48 states and they're they're available to anybody yep no that's, that is awesome that's a great great uh reason to go for it I, i'm curious maybe before we get into the kind of the how to's and, and all the getting started and, and kind of, or, and maybe just take it to the next level. Talk about some of the species. What, what are the most popular? Cause everybody probably thinks of bluegill, you know, other sunfish. What, what are the, give us a little rundown on the, the, the main species. So, I mean, sunfish is a, uh, the sunfish family is, is a pretty large group. It actually includes fish like, you know, the 
largemouth bass, smallmouth bass. They are technically members of the sunfish family. But when we um, when we think of sunfish, I think most of us think of the true sunfishes, and the the bluegill is probably the star of the stage. And that's probably because it's the most widespread out of uh, all of the species that are you know, spread throughout the United States. Bluegills have been stocked um, primarily along with largemouth bass and, you know, just about every body of uh, warm water from, from coast to coast. So they, you know, they got a pretty wide reach. And, you know, in fact, just about every lake and pond here in New Jersey or, you know, have bluegill in them, but bluegill were not native to New Jersey. You know, there are our native uh, sunfish, our, our large native sunfish would be the uh, pumpkin seed, which is a, uh, you know, another member of the sunfish family. And they're predominantly found here in the Northeast and the, uh, the upper Midwest. And as you get into, you know, the central part of the country, we start to see uh, species like the long ear uh, down south. We have, uh, you know, fish like red ear sunfish or shell crackers, as long as with some uh, Florida or southern strains of, of bluegill that tend to grow a little bit larger. And, you know, there's orange spotted sunfish. Uh, there's, there's a, a pretty wide range of these, these fish. And a lot of them have, you know, started out with pretty specific, uh, geographical ranges, but through, you know, stocking programs and, and other introductions, and a lot of them have been spread outside of their their normal areas, but none probably have been spread as far as the bluegill. I think the bluegill has uh, really dominated the you know the sunfish scene when it comes to uh, you know being stocked outside its native range. Yeah, yeah, blue, yeah, bluegill are definitely the the number one. It seems like so. There's so there's a bunch of species out there, and the, and the point like you made, it doesn't really matter if panfish. I mean, I guess maybe bass is a little bit different, but as far as the sunfish as you think of them, those laterally, you know, compressed, you know, wide football, big football shaped fish. I mean, those are those are the bluegills, and and what, whether you one fly is going to work for all of them, probably is that pretty much the situation. Well, there's um, they all from. Throughout most of the true sunfishes, uh, a lot of the techniques and flies that you use for one will work for others. Um, there are some outliers. You know, for example, the red ear sunfish is a uh, sunfish that really keys in on uh, organisms that live on a, a pond or stream bottom. Uh, it's it's a real big crustacean eater. It even eats uh, you know mollusks and you know freshwater clams, things of that nature. So they will occasionally rise to a dry fly, but if you're going to target them successfully, uh, you really need to uh, you know fish deep and, and get those flies down to where the fish normally feed. Uh, there's there's uh, other members of the family that we haven't really touched on, and that would be the uh, crappie. They're uh, white and black crappie are also members of the sunfish family. And, you know, as, as anglers that pursue them know that they're, uh, they're fond of feeding on, you know, smaller fish and minnows. Uh, they do feed quite heavily on insects as well, but, you know, targeting them with uh, streamers are uh, very effective. There's a... Uh, a sunfish called a flyer, which if you looked at it, it kind of looks like a cross between a, a bluegill and a crappie. And they're very uh, minnow oriented too in their, in their feeding habits. But by and large, most sunfish are uh, opportunistic feeders. Um, they're, they have a very varied diet from, you know, aquatic insects, uh, even uh, vegetation in some cases, uh, Terrestrial insects, anything that lands in the water and will fit in their mouth, will uh, you know they'll they'll try and take it. As well as you know, they do feed larger specimens. Uh, you know, will feed on young of the year fry and you know smaller fish. Again, if they can try and fit it in their mouths, they're gonna they're gonna eat it. Perfect, perfect. Okay, so that gives us a little rundown of some of the species and. And I'm curious if you think of, and I'm not sure of timing, you know, throughout the year um, as far as when people are fishing, but could we think of maybe late November into December timing? Is there some fishing going on in your area? Is this something, maybe talk about that and then also throughout the year, are there people, can you fish all year? Yeah. So as, as long as I have open water, um, you know, I can, I can fly fish for these guys and obviously a lot of, a lot of ice fishermen, uh, members of the sunfish family are 
know, they're caught throughout the ice year round. So a lot of ice fish have been targeted, but that's, uh, you know, outside of what we're talking about today. So as we get into the right now here in the Northeast, we still have some very mild weather and, you know, we, we have not had a killing frost here in, in New Jersey, at least in a part of the state that I live in. So, you know, the air is still a buzz with terrestrial insects and, you know, so dry fly fishing with, you know, just about anything you want at this point from, you know, foam bugs and hoppers and beetles and ants, um, you know, they're all still doing very well. But as we, you know, progress through the season and we get that killing frost and we start to lose some of those uh, terrestrial based insects, then it really becomes a subsurface game. And I like to fish with uh, soft tackles and wet flies. I can, you know, I can present them at depth. I can fish them slowly because, Bluegills, like like all other fish species, they are you know they react to water temperature, and as the water temperature cools, their metabolism slows down, and you know you have to slow down your uh, presentations to become effective. The finding the fish in colder water, I think, is the biggest challenge because these fish will they'll leave the shallows and you know they'll they'll seek out deeper water where they can find more stable conditions. Uh, to deal with the, you know, the, the cooler weather and the cooler water temperatures, but they are still catchable if you can find them. And as I move into the the cooler months, I tend to focus on, you know, smaller bodies of water where maybe that, uh, that deeper water is a little bit more accessible and maybe not as deep. For example, you know, if they're going to seek out some of the deepest water in, in their area, if you're fishing on a large lake or reservoir with, you know, those fish may, may hold in, you know, 25, 30 feet of water, which could make damn near impossible to, to reach with a fly. But if you're focusing on a farm pond with a maximum depth of six to eight feet, those, those fish are still within reach. Now, as the water cools down, they tend to, you know, bunch up a little bit, um, you know, usually by year class. So if you find some, some larger fish, there's usually going to be some larger fish around with them. And, you know, by the other side of the coin, if you're catching nothing but small fish, you may want to move on and, you know, search out other areas. We also get some, some dry fly fishing. Uh, you know, as you know, midges are active, you know, just about any time there's open water and we'll get, uh, we'll get those fish, you know, rising to, uh, to midges that are emerging on, you know, calmer sunny days uh, when when temps come up a little bit and we start to see a little bit more midge activity, uh, we'll we'll get rising fish right up till till ice up and actually very shortly after the ice leaves, uh, that'll become one again one of their primary food sources. So right now uh, it's pretty much anything you want to do, we can still get these fish, but as the water cools, uh, it'll be, you know, slowing down your, your presentations, fishing, uh, nymphs, uh, wet flies, small streamers, you know, basically everything will be subsurface at that point until uh, spring rolls around again and the fish start looking up. Gotcha. So, okay. So that, and that, if you look throughout the year, that's basically it. So, you know, terrestrials, if you want to get them on the surface when it's warm enough and probably some areas in the South, it might be, warm enough throughout the whole year, right? Where you could, you fish lots of terrestrials or, well, I guess that might change, but let, let's focus today. Let's focus today on your area and just to keep this a little bit focused. But so, so as you get into, like you said, end of November, December, it's going to start cooling down. So you're going to go below the, below the surface. Let's, let's start there on below the surface. So, and just generally talk about the gear. So first of all, rod reel line, uh, talk about what you're going to be using there. So, one of the, um, I think one of the things that turns people off when they initially start fishing for, for panfish, if they get out there and they they start throwing their five and six weights, even seven weights that they use for, you know, larger trout, um, you know, they may, they may find, uh, these smaller fish, you know, that they don't fight as hard. And it really, if I think pound for pound, they are some of the hardest fighting fish out there. And if you scale down your tackle to, uh, you know, match the fish that you're pursuing, pursuing, you'll get a lot more out of the, uh, out of the sport. So I basically fish a lot of, um, rods in like the two to four weight range. Um, I like, my personal favorite is a, you know, a, a slow action, full flex, 
uh, four weight fly rod. Um, I love fishing glass for these guys, but I like a, a four weight because it gives me a lot of options. It allows me to throw slightly larger, more air resistant, uh, flies like foam bugs and poppers, but still get a, um, you know, a bit of fight out of the fish. Uh, I love fishing lighter rods, like two weights and three weights. I mean, there is really nothing like fighting a 10 or 11 inch bluegill on a two weight. They will, uh, they'll definitely put a serious bend in that rod, but those lighter rods could have a little bit more of a problem, you know, casting, you know, larger flies that we sometimes use for them. So I think a four weight is a good all around tool, but you know, there's always a, uh, you know, two weight or a three weight within reach as well. Um, yeah. You know, and you know, as far as lines go that, that, um, you know, floating line will, will serve you for, you know, 95 or better percent of your fishing, but it's this time of year that, um, that I do break out a slightly heavier rod and start to throw some intermediate or sink tip, even full sinking lines to reach those deeper fish. And there not, there's not a lot of line manufacturers out there making these type of lines for, for a four weight about as the, you know, the lightest sinking line that you can, um, you know, readily find these days is probably a five weight. So, you know, I do keep a, you know, a five weight in the panfish arsenal, uh, again, trying to, to stick with a, uh, you know, slower, softer action rod. And I'll use that for what I need to get down to the fish, um, to, to throw that, uh, intermediate line or that sink tip or full sinking line. And it also will come in handy that heavier rod. If we're dealing with, um, windy conditions where I need to throw a, a bigger bug in the wind, or if I'm fishing a location that is, has a good predator population, we often encounter, uh, the, other fish species that occupy the same water, such as, you know, largemouth bass, smallmouth bass, trained pickerel, uh, even pike will, will take, you know, flies meant for panfish on a regular basis. So if I'm, I'm fishing in a locale that has a really robust bass population, then, you know, maybe sacrificing a little fight on the panfish side, but giving you the ability to land these, these larger predators, a, a rod like a five weight comes in handy. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, so it sounds like, I mean, you could, uh, yeah, five weight would work and a lot of people have five weights, so that might be a good place to get started. And, and the bonus is that you could fish the sinking line, the, and what you're saying is that if you had a three weight or a two weight, you're not going to get a sinking line that's going to fit that rod. No, you're not. I mean, you can, you can kind of get by sometimes with, uh, you know, a sinking poly leader or, uh, you know, some sort of sinking braid, but it's going to cast horribly. You're really not going to, uh, you know, have a pleasurable casting experience with it. So if you do need to go to a sinking line, you know, I usually reach for a five weight, but by and large, um, most of the fishing that I do is, is going to be with a, uh, a three or four weight. And when the conditions are, are perfect for it, I'll even break out the lighter rods, uh, you know, the two weights and, you know, I even have an old Orvis one weight floating around that I like to take out once in a while. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so that gives it. And now let's go back to. Um, so let's just say late November, December. So you're out there. Things are cold. You're you're having to get down. Talk about that. So you've got your rod. Um, you know, you got the line. So what is the line? If you maybe describe that. Take us to the water and talk about how you're finding fish uh, in that during that time period. So if I'm you know shore based angler you know if i'm fishing from shore i'm going to look for a spot or i'm going to select a, a body of water that i can reach that deeper water from the shore such as uh, you know, a lot of times we'll find um, on some of these man-made ponds in the area that that deeper water will be along the face of the dam so if i can you know access that deeper water from the from the shore then that would be you know the place to start off and yeah, you know, but I often fish from float tubes and kayaks as well. So if I'm in my my kayak, obviously I can uh, use my fish finder to to locate the fish. I can locate the deeper water. I can even locate the the fish themselves with the electronics. And so if I if I need to get down, say I can use that floating fly 
line with a either a sinking leader or a sinking fly, you know, pretty effectively down to depths of maybe six, even, um, you know, maybe touching eight feet. But once I get down below that range, I'm going to I'm going to switch over to either an intermediate or a, you know, a sinking line. And I have a, a few different lines that I use. Um, I have a, uh, you know, a clear intermediate line that, uh, you know, it's, it's a slow sinking line. So if you, you know, need to get flies really deep, it's a little bit of a hassle because you really have to, to count down to get those flies down to the fish. But um, for those, you know, fish in that six to eight foot range, um, you know, that's usually the line that I'll reach for. And, and deeper than that, it's, you know, then we're going to, uh, you know, either a full sinking line or a, uh, you know, a sink tip line. But again, with the five weight, you're not getting really heavy lines. So you're, you're, you're kind of at a disadvantage if you can't really find fish in that, say, 10 to 12 foot range, um, you're, you're really, it's going to be very difficult to reach them with a fly. You know, some of the things to keep in mind when we're, you know, fishing sinking lines is to have as straight a connection as possible to those flies because strike detection could be a little tricky. So we want to keep the, uh, you know, the rod tip low to the water. Uh, a lot of times I'll actually place that rod tip right into the water to maintain a, uh, you know, solid direct connection to what's going on at the end of my fly line. If you have the, if you're holding that rod tip high, you'll have a little bit of belly in that fly line as it droops down to the water and, you know, that can make strike detection near impossible. So having, you know, keeping that rod tip low and, uh, having a direct connection to your flies are essential for detecting hits, which are going to be a little bit, uh, they're going to be lighter this time of year because the fish are not moving as fast. They are a little bit sluggish. So, you know, sometimes a hit feels like nothing more than a little bit of weight on the line. Uh, the fish kind of will sneak up behind a fly, inhale it, and almost you almost feel like you're just dragging it through the water. You didn't feel a solid wrap or pull. So anytime you feel anything unusual, you, you want to set the hook. Uh, we also watch the tip of that line where it enters the water. And if you see you know, any unusual movements or twitching, you know, you want to react to that as well. As far as retrieves go, we, we need to move those sli- flies as slowly as possible. So I, I like to use a, I do a lot of hand twist retrieves. I, I seem to have um, better success when you know I'm slowly moving or gliding the flies through the water at a continuous rate as opposed to to stripping. I think uh, it probably makes in in these colder conditions it makes it a little bit easier for the fish to track those flies when they're when they're moving at a slow steady pace as a as opposed to uh, you know darting about when they're stripped. So I think in colder water, those uh, a slow hand twist retrieve is a is a good way to go, and it just becomes down to fact of of searching the water until you locate fish. And you know, as I said earlier, in in cooler water temps, they tend to bunch up a bit, and you'll if you find one, you'll usually find others in the same area. There you go. Okay, and then on the hand twist retrieve, describe that a little bit. How, how you do that. Yeah, it's um, it's kind of difficult to explain without a, a visualization, but it, um, I, I think it's also called like a figure eight retrieve, um, where you're basically uh, bringing in the the line with your. If I'm a, I'm a right handed caster, so with my left hand holding the line in my left hand, um, basically pinching it with my thumb and forefinger and rotating my hand around, and you kind of grab the line with your pinky and bring it back to the forefinger and thumb again. And you just kind of twist it back and forth in your hand constantly. And that gives the fly kind of a, the fly kind of collides through the water very slowly as opposed to a, uh, you could, you could do the same thing, I guess, with a slow methodical strip. Um, but I think the key here is, is just to keep the fly moving as slowly as possible. Another way to reach these uh, deep fish, or is to use a, uh, you know, like an indicator rig where I could suspend a sinking fly underneath an indicator. Um, this time of year when, you know, fish are still looking up, but they may, they may also be uh, moving towards deeper water, suspending a sinking fly off a, uh, you know, a foam bug or a popper or, you know, th- the classic hopper dropper techniques that we use on trout streams will work for, uh, for panfish as well. And I, even when, they get real deep. I'll, 
you know, I'll take clues from the, uh, you know, the guys that fish on the lakes and, you know, places like British Columbia for, for trout where they're using a, a slip indicator rig to get those sinking flies down to the fish. And if you got a, a day with a little bit of, little bit of chop on the water, maybe a little bit of breeze that's, uh, you know, putting a little disturbance on the water surface and you can float a, a small nymph or, uh, you know, I like, I like to use a, uh, like a small beadhead pattern that'll get that fly down as quick as possible and suspend that beneath a, beneath an indicator and you get a little surface disturbance. So it'll get that fly kind of moving up and down. That could be a, a deadly method for, for reaching these fish when they're you know, a little sluggish and holding in that deep water. Cause they're, they'll be reluctant to move any kind of great distance to, uh, to chase a fly when the water gets cold. Okay. So, so basically like you're saying, the wet fly, with that sinking line getting down to them, that does work with the slow retrieve, but you're also saying that the indicator, and how would you fish the indicator to them? I mean, once it's under the indicator, how do are you doing the same thing, kind of retrieving it in, or how does that look? If I can find fish, a lot of times if you just get that indicator over the fish and let it rest in that area, um, they will, you know, they'll find it, they'll come to it. Um, but if I'm searching with the indicator, it's going to be this kind of the same thing. You move the indicator, uh, you know, a couple inches to a foot, let the fly settle, hold it in the area for, for a, uh, for a little bit and then move it again. And again, when the, when the water gets really cold, uh, they get, they get very sluggish and they're not going to move to, uh, to a fly, but also strike detection is it, it does get difficult. Um, you know, I'm not going to lie. It's, it's a challenge. Do you recommend, I mean, in the colder part, uh, parts of the northern parts of the country, do you recommend, um, you know, fishing for them in the winter? Or does it make more sense just to wait until, you know, take a break and wait until they come out and you can get them on the surface? Yeah, I think most anglers would, would find a lot more enjoyment in uh, these fish if they uh, fish for them when they're the most active. You know, I'm I'm kind of a panfish nut, so if I can, if I can catch them, I'm, I'm going to go after them. But I think most anglers would be better served to, uh, you know, wait to the spring when the water warms in the spring. Um, this is the time, and this is where these fish get their, their pushover, uh, reputation. You know, there's, I hear a lot of times about, uh, you know, fly fishing for panfish that, you know, that the fish are almost suicidal. They'll take any type of fly. They're, they're real easy to catch. And that is true in, in the spring when the fish are pre-spawn and, you know, through their spawning, especially while they're spawning, uh, they very aggressively, uh, defend their nesting sites and they will attack anything that comes near, you know, even a bare hook will, will catch these fish. And that's where, you know, they, they really get their reputation for being, for being pushovers, but take that, that same fish and try and, you know, catch them during the dog days of summer when the water is, you know, when it's, uh, temps are warm and, you know, the fish are holding deeper and it, they're, they're a totally different animal. Yeah. The best time is that if you had to say that spring time is if you just want to have the most aggressive, that's, that's it. Yeah. In, in the spring, um, and for, for spring, spring means something different for, for different parts of the country. Obviously you mentioned earlier, I think that, you know, a lot of the South has, you know, some of their best fishing will be turning on during our winter months up here where we're shut out, you know, uh, you know, places like Texas and Florida, um, you know, their, their fishing season is really starting now for these guys because their waters are cooling to the point where the fish get a little bit more active. But uh, for me here in the Northeast, um, basically mid to late March, uh, those fish will start uh, to become a little bit more active as early as late February in some years, as, as the water, be, as ice leaves and the water begins to warm up, we'll have, um, you know, days, if we get a couple sunny days, it doesn't necessarily have to be particularly warm, but we get some bright, calm days. And especially if you're fishing a smaller body of water, our uh, dark bottom flats will start to to warm up, and those fish will will leave the their you know protection of deep water, and they'll start to venture into those flats. And you know, as long as the sun is shining and you know the water is warm, um, they could be caught in those in those areas. And in early spring, they tend to move back and forth between you know deep water and shallow, but eventually conditions stabilize enough for for those fish to move into the shallows permanently and that's when the fishing will get uh, really exceptional um, pre-spawn 
the fish there may be not there may not be a lot of uh, dry fly activity yet because the water's still on the cool side but those fish will you know they'll aggressively take uh, you know small wet flies and streamers and and nymphs presented below the surface but as we get into the the warmer periods once the spawn starts now you'll catch fish top to bottom and you know if you can locate a uh most sunfish will nest in colonies, so they don't have individual nests, but you know, you could have uh, you know, a group of nests of 20, 30, even a hundred or more. And, you know, those areas will just be uh, loaded with fish. And this is where a lot of anglers do their pan fishing. You know, they'll they'll fish for that those couple weeks out of the year while the fish are spawning, and then they don't touch them again until you know the following year because the you know that is when the fishing is so good for them. Well, and, and the talk to the top to bottom is good. Let, let's focus. We talked a little bit about the colder. Let's just focus on that springtime. And it sounds like it doesn't really matter what you put on. But what would that look like? Uh, I guess you could use the same rod. What, what sort of uh, top water bugs are you using? So I'll start out early in the year um, using a lot of traditional dry flies actually work very well for panfish. Um, you know, that size 14 parachute atoms, probably the most popular dry fly in the world is, you know, just an, an absolute killer when it comes to these guys. Um, mosquito imitations work, work very well. Depending on where you're fishing, you want to try and, you know, match the hatch, so to speak, as, as well as you can. Some, some lakes that these fish occupy will have, um, you know, some mayfly species maybe some calabatus stuff like that will be you know popping about midges are always a uh, you know a good opportunity early in the year but once the water warms till we start to get a lot of um, you know the terrestrials wake up and you know dragonflies and damselflies start moving around you know at that at that point the fish are used to seeing so many different items landing on the surface of the water that you can really use anything uh, if you were to look into my warm water uh surface fly box you'll see a lot of really odd looking flies uh, one of my uh most popular flies that i uh that i developed is a fly called a triangle bug which is a real kind of unique looking fly it's it's the body is a, a, a triangular piece of foam with a with a wide leading edge at the hook point and a kind of the the narrow edge of the triangle tapers back to the hook bend. And that fly was basically designed for one purpose and one purpose only is to keep these small mouth panfish from, from swallowing the fly too deeply. One of the things that uh, it's kind of discouraging to a lot of anglers when they fish for these guys, they have a tendency to take flies very deeply. So, you know, often if you're, you plan on releasing fish, um, you know, hook removal could be a problem. If you're keeping fish for the table, it's, it's not a big deal, but you know, if you want to release them, you know, carrying a, uh, set of forceps is almost uh, mandatory to get those, uh, deep hooks out of those small mouths. But the triangle bug was designed to prevent the fly from, excuse me, prevent the fish from fall, swallowing the fly too deeply. So it has that narrow back end that the fish can easily take off the water, but it has that wide leading edge that you know, prevents the fly from uh, being swallowed too deeply. Now, I can't tell you what that triangle bug is supposed to imitate. It was really just designed to, to keep the fish from swallowing the fly. Maybe they could take it as a, as a small frog. Uh, maybe it has that kind of profile. But uh, it's it's one of the things I love about panfish is that you can get very creative with your with your fly designing and you know create some really unique flies that that work very well on on these guys. As far as finding the fish, I mean, again, so we're going whether it's the winter or the summer. How hard is you go to a new lake, you look out or a pond or whatever? Do you just have to kind of cover if you don't have a fish finder and things like that? What would you recommend to find these fish? Well, the great thing about them is that they're, you know, they're creatures of habit. They, they're going to occupy the same kind of habitat in, in every watershed. By and large, uh, sunfish are, are shallow water fish. They, they orient uh, very well to uh, bankside structure. So, uh, you know, fallen trees and, and overhanging tree limbs that provide shade along the bank are going to be places where they uh, congregate. And again, they, they occupy a lot of different types of water. So, you know, it's not only, you know, lakes and ponds that we find these fish, we find them in, you know, slower moving rivers and streams. So, 
you know, their, their habitat in moving water is a little bit different from that in still water. And, you know, we could touch a little bit on each of that. But in, in, a, in a pond environment, they're going to be relating to uh, shoreline structures such as, uh, you know, vegetation, lily pads, weed beds, uh, overhanging tree limbs, submerged trees, you know, trees that have been blown over into yeah. the water. Um, so any structure, man made. Yeah, yeah, any kind of cover, really. Um, the one thing that uh, you need to remember about these guys is that everything wants to eat a bluegill. Everything wants to eat a sunfish. They are predominantly stocked in a lot of locations as a prey species for larger fish like largemouth bass. And it's uh, it's a unique fish that grows to a large size because they're at such a great risk of predation from you know everything from other fish and birds and turtles and you know there's everything out there eats a bluegill so uh they're they they want to be around cover you know someplace that they can dart in for protection when uh you know danger rears its ugly head so fishing around structure is going to be your your best bet you know with the exception of the spawn and when the fish are spawning they'll occupy um your water you know stream or uh pond bottoms that are suitable for for spawning kind of a harder substrate they like like sand and gravel areas to to make their nests and those nests will often be in you know large colonies and in, in open waters you know they follow the kind of safety and numbers principle but once the the spawn is over those fish are going to uh you know retreat back to those areas of cover so fishing around around those places is is pretty much guaranteed success And now let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. In today's world of mass-produced products, Stonefly Nets has reclaimed the tradition of handcrafted care with their custom wood landing nets. Stonefly starts the design process by selecting wood for the handle based on a number of key factors, including grain pattern and depth, but they don't stop there. This piece of art is accentuated by strips of hardwood that complement and accentuate the handcrafted handle. To be honest, I have never been a huge net guy, mainly because I didn't feel like my uh, old collapsible net was easiest to use and was not easy on the eye, if you know what I mean. The Stonefly uh, net not only looks beautiful, but has high quality netting that is easy on the fish and will last for years to come. Stonefly's goal is to create a unique custom classic wood net that's second to none and can be customized for a little extra touch. When Ethan designs a custom net, it's his hope that others will create amazing lasting memories for years to come. Please head over to wetflyswing.com slash stonefly to get your custom net now. That's wetflyswing.com slash stonefly, S-T-O-N-E-F-L-Y, to get started right now. Okay, let's get back to the show. What about, so going back to the sinking line, let's take it back to that winner. So... You mentioned it's hard to find a, for a three weight or something, but if you did have a five or a four weight, what is what sinking line? Is there a name just so we can kind of have a better idea of what you mean by like full sink? And do you have a specific line? There's a few different um, options out there. There's with Rio right now. There, I think that that five weight is going to be your really your lightest line that you can you know find a sinking line and if you're going to fish you know it's not the same you couldn't use that six weight to do it but you're you're just not going to get a you're not going to appreciate the fight of the fish yeah i think the line that i'm using right now is the phantom the uh the phantom sinking line oh, yeah. and that that will yeah that'll come in a uh in a in a five weight yeah, it's interesting they don't have any li- – I mean, I guess, again, it's supply and demand, right? Nobody's really – Yeah, it's a, it's a specialty – it's a specialty line, you know, and you're not going to get those really heavy sink rates either. That's your – I think these lines are usually somewhere between three and five inches per second, you know, so they're not real um, – no, they're not a real depth charge. You're going to have to go to something, you know, a bit heavier to get that. And that's why if I can't – find those fish i usually limit my fishing this time of year to those small smaller bodies of water where i'm not dealing with water depths deeper than six or eight feet 
Exactly. That makes sense. That might be the takeaway here is that you could, yeah, you can go as deep. It's like any, any example, right? You can go to the extreme, but maybe it makes more sense to go just find shallower bodies of water where you don't have to use a super heavy. And you could still, like you said, use a lighter line. Maybe you're just kind of stripping or not stripping. You're retrieving the wet flies, keeping it really simple. That's, uh, sounds exactly. like, yeah, that's one way to do it. What, what about um, on flies? And I know it sounds like flies don't uh, matter that much, but I'd, I'd be interested to hear your kind of top, you know, 10 or 20 or whatever. If you talk about flies, what would you throw out there in your box throughout the whole year? Uh, what are those panfish flies? Can you name a few of those? Right. And I, I will say that flies do matter. Um, yeah. There's a very short window of time where these, these fish get you know, like I said, almost suicidal when they're defending their beds and, um, they're, they'll, they're apt to take just about anything, but outside of those few weeks of the year, um, they could get very particular at times. So, um, you know, flies, flies do matter. And I think probably by and large, um, my most popular subsurface, uh, flies is I, I'll fish a lot of wet flies and soft tackles. Um, I, I can fish them in a, in a, wide variety of ways i can fish them very slowly i can fish them erratically i can you know make them do a lot of different things and you know one of the things that you have to keep in mind in these environments is is dealing with the structure that you're likely to take these fish around so you know we're we're dealing with aquatic vegetation things like weed beds and maybe lily pads and i don't fish weedless flies per se but i need to fish flies that i can um move around the weeds if you will so you know a, a fly like a wet fly i can i can easily manage the depth on that i can fish it deep i can fish it uh shallow if i have a heavily weighted nymph or maybe a fly with uh you know bead chain or lead eyes you know that fly is going to want to get to the bottom as quick as possible and if i'm fishing a you know a hard clean bottom that's great but those flies won't work very well when you know the bottom of the the lake is is covered with uh some sort of weed growth or algae or muck of some sort which is find a lot in in these types of environments so you know, often it becomes a, an issue of, you know, fishing a a fly deep, but getting it, keeping it above the weed line. So one specialty technique that I do use during the warmer months where that sinking line comes back in is fishing a floating fly on a sinking line. Um, you know, take, taking a large insect like a, uh, a dragonfly nymph that I can imitate you know, it's a, it's a fairly large fly, uh, you know, maybe a size eight that I can, you know, build up with a lot of foam and, and make a very buoyant fly, but fish that fly on a, on a leader that'll keep that fly suspended above the weeds as my sinking fly line, you know, pulls the fly down. So, you know, that's, that's a, you know, another technique that I use during the uh, warmer months when those fish are again, holding in, in deeper water, not because of, uh, well, it is because of water temperature it's because the surface water is too warm and they're, they're seeking that, that deeper water. If we had your, uh, you know, whatever it is, your top 10 or top, whatever, uh, give, give us, uh, give us a rundown of some of those flies. As far as, you know, my preferred panfish flies, my favorite panfish flies, I, I think that the, uh, the top fly for me, top producer year round would be some sort of a wet fly or soft tackle. Uh, although everybody likes to catch fish on the top and that's one of the great things about panfish. They will readily take flies off the surface. Uh, just like almost any form of fishing, we'll, we'll always catch more fish if we fish below the surface. So uh, wet flies and soft tackles allow me to fish a variety of depths at a variety of speeds. I can... I can strip them real slow. I can strip them fast and erratic. So I can usually match that wet fly to what the fish are eating and you know, presenting it in a way that looks appealing to them. So wet flies are, are real big and I will fish them year round and they become particularly important during the cooler months. As I mentioned earlier about top water, uh, you know, that is probably everybody's favorite way to fish. Uh, makes, obviously, strike detection very easy. We know exactly when, you know, the fish grabs our fly and uh, the, the takes are often uh, exciting. So, 
you know, there's always a, a lot of top water patterns in my, uh, in my fly box. I tend to fish a lot of foam bugs. Um, one of the big things about fishing for panfish is you have the opportunity to catch a lot of them. And, you know, so when it comes to fly design and tying flies, you want to, you want flies that have as much durability built into them as possible. So, uh, you know, you can keep on catching fish without having to, uh, you know, change flies out. So foam is a extremely durable material, holds very well, holds up very well to, uh, to the fish. So, you know, there's, there'll be a lot of top water foam patterns in my box of various designs. Are there any uh, on your box, uh, Bar? Are there any like? Could we go to your website if we wanted to see some of these flies? Are there names of any of these flies? Oh, absolutely! Yeah, if you head over to Panfish on the Fly, there's um, you know a pretty extensive library of uh, panfish patterns, and they're all separated by category. So you could search wet flies, nymphs, top water flies, streamers. Um, you'll find a lot of these uh, these patterns there. Um, and you know, I have designed a number of you know, panfish specific flies that that work very well so uh you, you'll find all that information there on the website and that's uh, simply uh www.panfishonthefly.com real easy to remember okay perfect yeah and i'm looking i'm looking at it now so you have a yeah you got a good mixture streamers top water wet flies and i'm just clicking on the wet fly so yeah there's all sorts of um you know variations and colors and and types and uh the the McGinney the McGinney wet fly is that how you pronounce that the McGinty yes oh yeah McGinty yeah what, what's that one about that one's got a nice bright red tail uh, is red is that one of those key like a hot spot is that a good color to use well I I think that uh, panfish are definitely uh, they definitely cue in on colors um, I I think color is a is a real uh, important factor when it comes to uh, panfish flies. You know, there's, there's two, just like, you know, any other type of, uh, you know, fly design, you know, we, we tie patterns that are, that are imitative, you know, we try and, you know, exactly imitate the food form that, uh, we're, we're trying to represent. And then we have the, you know, the attractor style flies that are relying on things like movement or color or, uh, flash, you know, something that's going to grab that fish's attention and pique its curiosity enough that he's going to come over and take a nip at it. So, um, I do fish a lot of, uh, you know, if you look at, um, just the kind of a general assortment of, uh, you know, wet fly patterns, you'll, you'll see things like your, your classic soft tackles, your, your, your classic, you know, partridge and hare or partridge and olive or partridge and yellow, you know, these classic trout patterns work, work very well for, for panfish. And then you take a fly like the McGinty, which, um, you know, is a classic old school trout pattern. I mean, that's where that fly comes from. And it, it kind of looks like a, like a, like a bumblebee with the yellow and black body and the red tail and the, uh, you know, the white and black wing, you know, there's a lot going on there. And it's, it's those, those colors, those hot spots that, uh, attract the fish. Um, so, you know, we can, um, you can fish a wide variety of flies and there's even more patterns in the, the blog section of the website. There's a, a regular feature that I do called fly time Friday. And there's a, uh, you know, ton of flies that are discussed on those blog posts with, uh, you know, pattern with, with complete pattern recipes, tying instructions, uh, you know, even, even videos in some cases. So if we wanted to just grab, say, like 10 flies that, you know, we, we had nothing in our box and wanted to grab 10, we could probably just go to your your site and click on the top water section and just grab like the triangle bug, the super. You know ant. what? Yeah. I'm going to check something real quick, but I actually think that if you were to hit the old search bar there that you're going to finally find, you're probably going to find a blog post that discussed just that. So let's see here. Top 10. And where is the search? And I don't see the search bar on your website. It's right on the homepage. Um, oh, it's, it's not on the secondary. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you go right to the homepage, it's it's right underneath the, uh, you know, that the, the first image there. Oh yeah, it's underneath the first image. I see it. Yep. I think actually one of my most popular uh, blog posts is is just that. You know, the the top ten panfish flies. Oh, there you go. So we're hitting on yeah. it. We're gonna yeah. Yeah. And. Um, 
And, you know, that would be a good place just to kind of go over, um, you know, here's my top 10. Uh, and so we talk about things like, you know, for, for those durable top water foam bugs, that, that triangle bug is, is right there at the top. Uh, soft tackles are. Oh yeah. Did you, you know, find the, did you find the blog post? Yeah. I'm, I'm looking at it. Well, what's it called? It's uh, the top 10 flies for bluegills. <laughs> okay. <laughs> pretty, for bluegill. pretty straightforward. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm uh, I'm still trying to pull it up, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, you know, foam bugs, um, they're they're right up there. You know, everybody loves to take on top water. Foam creates a very durable pattern. Uh, you know, soft tackles and wet flies, which I mentioned before. Uh, poppers of all types of varieties, whether we're fishing, you know, old school cork poppers or the modern foam bugs, foam poppers. There's some great uh, popper bodies being produced by uh, Flyman. Uh, fishing company their double barrel poppers are available in uh you know sizes f- to fish for the, the tiniest uh panfish right up to blue water species so uh, they make some great uh top water flies i really like fishing uh, damsel and dragonfly nymph imitations um, they are probably one of the most prevalent aquatic insects that these fish come across uh, and uh, they're real important uh, parts of their diet, so they always produce very well. So uh, the classic woolly worm is is one of my top patterns. Um, it is a you know kind of smaller cousin to the woolly bugger. Actually, I think the woolly bugger was designed originally from the the woolly worm came first. And the woolly worm has again has that nice red tail. Right, right. You know, you can and you can vary the colors. Um, you know, the, I think probably my favorite is that yellow body red tail with a with a grizzly hackle running through. Um, it's an absolutely killer fly. No fly box is going to be complete without uh, you know some sort of rubber legged subsurface pattern. Uh, a fly like a bully spider, or you know on on my on this particular blog post, I, I mentioned a fly called a brim killer, which is a you know chenille bodied fly with rubber legs and a squirrel tail wing that has a real seductive slow sink rate, and you know the fish often take that fly on the drop. You know, casting that fly along the edges of a submerged tree and just letting it slowly settle through the water column, watching that leader for a little tick as the, uh, you know, fish takes the fly on a drop. That could be a, you know, deadly way to catch some big bluegills and big sunfish. There's a unique fly on my list. Um, and I love talking about this fly. This this fly is called the James Wood Bucktail. So the James Wood Bucktail is a uh, really unique looking fly. It's a fly that was developed by Harry Murray. Harry Murray owns a fly shop in Edinburgh, Virginia. And um, Harry is kind of a smallmouth bass specialist as well as a... Uh, you know, a guy that really knows the the mountain streams of the uh, Shenandoah is like a back of his hand. But uh, he he is a smallmouth angler, spends a lot of time fly fishing for smallmouth on the uh, the local rivers and streams in that area. And he developed a fly called the James Wood Bucktail, which was supposed to imitate a, uh, a immature sunfish. Um, as I mentioned earlier, that these... Um, these fish are prey species to uh, larger fish like smallmouth bass, largemouth bass, and they they often end up in the stomachs of these these larger predators. And the James Wood bucktail is a, is a fly that was designed to uh, imitate a immature bluegill. Now, if you look at this fly, it, to me, it doesn't look anything like a sunfish. It's got a big blue bulbous head, a sparse white bucktail wing, and a yellow chenille body, but the fish go absolutely nuts over this pattern, and uh, big bluegill particularly. Um, so you tie this, kind of scale down. I think Harry tied this fly in like a size 2 or 4 for smallmouth. I'll tie it all the way down to a size 12 for uh, for panfish, but typically a size 8, even a size 6 is is a great uh, searching pattern for, for big sunfish. And it will also take its share of, um, you know, other predators like bass and, and pickerel seem to go after this fly quite a bit. I like flies with... Um, bead chain or even lead eyes when I need to get them down a little bit deeper. So there's a you know a whole host of patterns, nymph patterns that fall into this category. I have a um, a fly I call the panfish wiggler, which 
Um, you being a steelhead guy, uh, may be familiar with a, uh, steelhead pattern called Springs Wiggler. And, you know, it was a, a steelhead nymph that had a, uh, you know, bee chain eyes and usually a, a bright colored chenille body with a, uh, you know, a squirrel, squirrel tail, um, shell back and tail with a hackle wound through it. I had, I was on a, on a, trout fishing trip up in um up in michigan up in the baldwin area and i was in a fly shop and you know i saw some of these uh these flies in the uh the fly bin there and i i brought a couple home with me and they sat around in a box for years and at one point or another they they found their way into a warm water box and you know the panfish went absolutely nuts over them so i took that pattern and adapted it a little bit and created that panfish wiggler which is a, a natural more natural colored pattern but it has all the same attributes that that squirrel tail shell back and tail and the bee chain eyes and you know a, a, either a buggy dubbed or chenille body with hackle winding through that's uh, a, a very effective pattern and um Again, classic trout wet flies. I love tying them. I love fishing them for trout, but I also take those same patterns and I, you know, I, I fish them in warm water as well. And I think you had mentioned the McGinty earlier. Um, one, one of the unique things about, uh, we know that a lot of different fish um, will, will take bee patterns. You know, bee patterns are popular for trout, but panfish in particular seem to, to relish them, um, especially this time of year. We, um, the yellow jackets and, and bees are, are very active in, on these warm fall days and particularly yellow jackets. And they seem to find their way into the water pretty frequently. And you know, I've had a lot of heated discussions with folks over the fact, you know, whether or not, you know, you know, fish will, will eat bees, you know, if they, uh, you know, react to the stings. And, and I honestly don't think they do. Um, I have seen, you know, bees land in the water and instantly get gobbled up by fish. And I fish a lot of bee imitations, both surface patterns and subsurface patterns uh throughout the year whenever those insects are active and uh, catch a lot of fish on them so uh yeah they're they're up there on the list as well mm -hmm. nice i'm just looking um and that's great that's a great uh uh summary there and fine and i'm just looking at one of the comments this is from um lane from like uh, uh let's see he talked about if you want real action, try doubling or even tripling up on your flies. My favorite rig is to tie a small dry first, matching the bugs on the surface. Does, do you see that comment? Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So, and that's one of the ways that, you know, and with pan fishing, uh, you often end up with a lot of doubles. You'll, you'll catch two fish at the same time. But one of the ways that I deal with, you know, problems with, uh, weeds and vegetation, because as the season progresses and those weeds and lakes, they start inching ever closer and closer to the surface. Um, one way that we can prevent sub or excuse me, present subsurface flies is to hang them off the back of a larger dry fly. Uh, once again, foam is a, is a great candidate for this. One fly I didn't mention is uh, Jack, Jack Gartside's Gurgler. I tie a lot of different gurgler patterns um, for bass and panfish. I think that's one of the most versatile, you know, top water patterns that was ever created, whether you're chasing striped bass or bluegills. Uh, you can tie that fly in, you know, in, in some fashion that will, uh, you know, attract fish on the surface. So a gurgler is a pattern that I, you know, that, that comes to mind as far as a fly that I like to suspend uh, something off the back of it. The way I tie them, there's usually a couple layers of foam involved, so it's a very buoyant fly. It, it, it floats kind of high, and when I tie the patterns, I'll actually tie in a, a small mono loop at the uh, the back end of the, uh, you know, before I uh, t mount any materials onto the hook, I'll, I'll usually take a, you know, pound of uh, 15 or 20 pound mono, and I'll create a small loop at the back of the fly as a tie-in point for adding a dropper. So I, I don't have to tie to the bend of the hook or try and find some other way to attach a dropper. And it allows me to, you know, drop a fly off the, the back of a, a floating fly, like a small nymph or a wet fly or, you know, even a small streamer. Um, 
when the fish are particularly active, you know, moving a, a gurgler or a popper, you know, across the surface of the water and having a, a small streamer dangling, you know, 18 inches or two feet below it, you know, darting through the water, um, you can get some pretty exciting fishing. So we've got the, the 10, the gurgler. Give us a couple more if it like maybe something that isn't on that list. Do you have anything that comes to mind just for pan fish in general? Yeah. So um, one of the things I love is, you know, I love scaling down uh, larger flies meant for other fish. For example, you know, everybody loves, um, you know, fishing frog patterns for, for larger predators like bass and, and pike and snakeheads. And, you know, I'll take these... Um, you know, traditional frog patterns and I'll, I'll shrink them down to minuscule sizes. So, uh, you know, I, I tie a a fly, I call the wee frog and it's a, it's, I think it's tied on a size 12, um, hook and it's uh, using the, the smallest micro size frog legs from, from Pat Cohen. He makes these, um, pre-stamped, uh, it's part of his creature series. He has a whole host of, uh, you know, different tailing materials made out of a very durable material that, that takes color very well. So you can dress them up any way you want it. And, you know, I'll, I'll tie on a, a small set of frog legs and, you know, build a small body out of foam or deer hair and, you know, fish small, small frog pot patterns for these fish, which are particularly um, effective very early in the spring. It's, it's usually one of my first go-to uh, topwater patterns. Uh, they seem to key in on, on the small emerging frogs that we have in this area. And, and these, these, these bugs will be no more than an inch long. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll be very small. Uh, streamers are another thing that um, I, I fish a lot of and, I like fishing flies that will not only attract the attention of larger panfish, but also um, attract the attention of, of predators as well. So kind of keeps fishing very interesting where, you know, on one cast, you may catch a 10-inch bluegill, and on, on a subsequent class, you could catch a three or four-pound largemouth, and a, and a four-pound largemouth on a four-weight is a hoot. So, um, you know, I, I like to fish these flies that are in this – size eight or six range that um predominantly that size six is the sweet spot for me it's it's big enough for to attract the attention of a larger predator like a bass but it's small enough that a you know a large sunfish can can still take it pretty easily is the crappie um, i'm looking at like the crappie bucktail is that is that one that's decent yeah yeah so that's um you know that is another way of um Oh, that's similar to the uh, that's similar to the James Wood buck. Yeah. So what what I did with the James Wood is I have a whole series of flies that are based on that platform, and you know, different I, colors. Yeah, and I think I've done about nine. I think nine different variations, imitating everything from uh, you know immature crappie to uh, you know small bass and small mm. chain pickerel, and and I actually think that some of these other versions of the bucktail, particularly that crappie version, and even I think I have a version for a, a you know a baby largemouth, they actually could fool you know they they look more to my eye anyway as an imitation of that immature fish the um the original james wood bucktail uh you know it, it looks like a clown fly to me but yes yeah, it does absolutely it looks weird. <laughs> yeah and and most people would look at that and you know just kind of shake their head and say you're full of it but yeah it is a killer pattern and yeah. if you if you dig into the history of this fly it was actually a bonefish pattern um, it oh, was, wow. yeah, it, the fly was developed on the bonefish flats and, you know, Harry Murray adopted it for, for use on a small mouth stream and, and I've shrunk it down and, you know, turned it into a, uh, a panfish fly. Gotcha. Nice, nice. Well, we could, uh, I think we could go on all day. These flies look pretty awesome. I'm looking at another one, the golden retriever, <laughs> the, the golden retriever, right? That looks like a killer one. Is that one? Yeah. Solid and, as and well? that's, and that's another fly that's coming from the trout stream. You know, I mean, that's, uh, yeah. in fact, that golden retriever is the, where I just came back from in Maine. Uh, that is probably the number one landlocked salmon streamer pattern. It is the that's particular it. stream that I fish is, 
everybody's fishing a golden retriever and catching gotcha. salmon on that fly. There you go. So. Yeah, it looks cool. Okay, well let's uh, let's take it out of here. Uh, we touched on a fly. I think we have a good list now. We can uh, we'll, we'll have our own. We'll top uh, whatever thirteen flies or something like that. But um, I think uh, you know a couple of things here. You know the two twenty two is you have probably heard this before. Top tips, tools, and resources. I'm just curious on the. Um, on the resources. So other than you, your site is a, a wealth of, of a resource, any other pan fishing resources out there you'd recommend books, magazine, or anything like that? Uh, videos? You know, that's, that's one of the reasons why I started the website in the first place is because there was not a lot of information on it. I'm, I'm actually in the process of um, writing a book on the subject. Um, I'm under contract with uh, with a publisher. Uh, the the book will be out in a uh, little less than two years, so it's it's going to address this this very topic of fly fishing for panfish, and it's going to be a uh, you know a regional book you know covering panfish species uh, across the country. So that that'll be something to look for in I think June of twenty three. I think is what we're looking at for the publishing date for that. That's great. And is there any other, I mean, so there right now there isn't really a fly fishing book for panfish. Yo, no, there are, there are a couple. Yeah. There's a couple good titles out here. Um, Terry and Roxanne Wilson are, uh, they're a, you know, an author team that has, um, put a couple books out on the subject. They have, um, I think the title is Bluegill Fly Fishing and Flies was their uh, their first book. They also have a book out on fly fishing for crappie uh, specifically. Um, yeah, have, so there, there are a few few things. Yeah, there are. Um, yeah, Jack Ellis's uh, book Sunfishes. Uh, I think that was put out by Lions Press. Um, there have been a number of books that have come out in the past. Uh, nothing recently. Um, I think there's there's still a lot more to be written on the subject. Um, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of folks out there that that want to fly fish that you know that they think that fly fishing is only for trout and salmon. And you know my whole goal starting this website and and just trying to you know we have a lot more a lot more land in this country without trout streams than with and and you know fly fishing doesn't have to be limited to uh you know cold water trout and salmon streams i mean that that was my initial attraction you know that's that's what i wanted to do i wanted to be that guy in that magazine that was on some pristine western river fly fishing for rising trout but you know there's um there's a lot of folks out there that they're they're fly fishing seems to stall because they don't spend enough time doing it. Fly fishing for them is that two week vacation that they take every year where they travel up North or they travel out West. And that's the only time they pick up the fly rod. And there's a lot of folks that fall into that category. So, you know, my kind of objective with the website, with the book is to get more people fly fishing. You know, I, I don't care what you fly fish for, just get out there and fly fish. And, Fly fishing does not have to revolve around trout and salmon. There is a whole world of warm water fly fishing that's out there waiting for you. Um, if you live near uh, one of our coasts, there's saltwater fly fishing opportunities that you may not be aware of. And, you know, that was the main catalyst for, for getting this website off the ground is to get people interested in uh in fly fishing and fly fishing for panfish is the easiest way to, to make that happen. That's it. Okay. Perfect. Um, and it, just a couple more as we wrap this up. So uh, just on tips, so take us back to that, you know, maybe a tip in the winter and a tip in the summer. What would you give us for you're out there in November, December fishing? Any, uh, is there a tip that comes to mind that might help somebody find, you know, get some fish, get some action? Yeah, but- my best tip is go fish for trout. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Don't even try it. Don't even go for yeah, it. It's, you know, like I said, it is a, um, this is these times of years where it, it really becomes like, you know, most fish species have that little niche of specialization where, you know, you're, you got to do something really different to get the fish. And unless you're up for a challenge, um, cold water pan fishing is a, it's a challenge unless you're fortunate to live in one of our warmer climates. Um, 
you know, this is the time of year. If you're down in Texas, if you're in Florida, if you're in the Southeast, the Southwest, this is the time. And that time will extend all through the winter months. So, but if you're here in the Northeast, uh, our seasons are winding down, um, in the far North, we're starting to get ice on the lakes already. And, uh, so that's coming to an end. I, I do it just as, like I said, I like to fish. I like to fish a lot. And, you know, for me to get out on the water, then maybe that means if I can't free up uh, a full day to get out on a trout stream, I'm going to try and go dredge up a panfish somewhere. G- give us a, uh, give us a, then let's take it to the spring or summer, you know, more okay. of the warmer times. Sure, give us a couple, sure. of, give a couple of fishing tips there. So what happens once we get past the, um, the spawn when, when fish are, you know, almost suicidal and very easy to catch, uh, the panfish are going to retreat to their, their normal year round haunts. Um, they're going to stay relatively shallow or at least close to shallow water. But as the water heats up during the summer, um, and again, it doesn't take place. If you're in the far North, then you're going to enjoy some good fishing. You know, you're, prime fishing is going to be in the middle of the summer but here in the northeast our days get warm and sticky and hot and water heats up significantly to the point where the shallows get a little bit too warm to be comfortable for larger panfish specimens so those fish are going to move towards their deeper water haunts Um, they may not retreat as deep as they do in the winter but they're going to be looking for things like shade they're going to be looking for depth they're going to be looking for stable water conditions but they still want to come into the shallows to feed so if you uh you know one tip for someone who's fishing during the dog days of summer is to fish early and late get out there at first light or get out there just as it's getting dark and fish on onto dark and as well as fishing on, you know, overcast cloudy days, um, you know, that'll bring the fish uh, a little bit closer, but it can, you wonder where they all go in the middle of summer sometimes because, um, you know, they're not in their traditional haunts because right. of that heat. Huh. And they're pretty hard to catch in the, uh, the super hot. They hunker down and are they, if you find them, are they still hard to catch? No, no. If you find a fish, they'll eat. I mean, that's one of the great things about these fish is, is they, they eat under a wide range of, uh, you know, they eat all year round. I mean, that's why ice fishermen are, are these fish are so popular with the ice fishermen because they, you know, they will feed during these really cold periods. So they'll continue to eat. Uh, you may have to, um, be a little bit more specific with fly selections, um, you know, to, to get them to eat. But if you're, um, if you can find them, you'll, you'll catch them. Absolutely. But the key is sometimes finding them. All right. Well, I'll uh, link everything out um, to panfishonthefly.com. And I'm curious, every once in a while we have a, a you know, a, a previous ex-police officer on. I always, I, I always go back to the Dean Finnerty episode, episode 19, where he told this crazy story about him dressing up in um in costumes i'm curious and you're i'm not sure what, what did you do as a police officer did you have any crazy uh events or was it were you oh like, no well it was it was 30 years of crazy events i was a um you know i had a 30 year career i retired as a as a police captain but my uh career spanned everything from undercover narcotics to uh you did SWAT team operations oh wow and, yeah no I did did a little bit of everything what was the, what was it? What's the story, a crazy story you could tell us that you, that would be, uh, you know, anything stick out to you? Uh, there's probably some statues of limitations. I still got to worry about. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's no, right. we, it was, it was a great career. It, it really was. But, um, you know, I, I realized that when I was done, I was done. And, uh, and then I turned to fly fishing, you know, I took up guiding and I've been guiding now for about seven years. I also work for Orvis. I work for Orvis in uh, Princeton, New Jersey. And oh, really? Oh, wow. I was hired there as a uh, fly fishing and fly tying instructor. And, um, you know, since COVID came around, that kind of put a, a damper on our in-person classes. So uh, I still I still work for them. Um, you know, I, I'm there very, very part time. And, you know, I just help out in the fly shop there. But um, it's been great. It's, it's really it's uh, it's a way to stay close to you know, what has been a passion of mine for close to 45 years and, uh, you know, guiding here in New Jersey, it's primarily for trout and, and that's a, you know, it's the shoulder seasons, it's the spring and the fall and winter months. So, you know, we give the trout a break during the summer because most of our rivers, although they will support, uh, you know, fish year round in the Northern part of the state, it gets a little bit too warm to, uh, to target them during the summer. So we give them a break, but 
things are starting to uh, cool down, and so the the guiding is getting underway, and we're pretty busy with that. I, I guide for Shannon's Fly Shop up in uh, Califon, New Jersey. Oh wow! So, yeah, so you're. I mean, this is like you're uh, you're retired from uh, you know your police off from that uh, line of work, and now it's like you're full time in this. Is that? It seems pretty awesome. You just. It sounds like you're kind of a workaholic. You can't. You can't stop working. Yeah, that was pretty much it. Um, I just kind of just switched gears a little bit, and uh, but now the difference is I'm doing something that I love, you know, and uh, it doesn't when you when you do something that you love, it doesn't feel like work. It doesn't feel like work at all, and I still have plenty of time to uh, you know to get out and travel. And like I said, I just got back from Maine. I'm I'm leaving on Sunday for uh, West Virginia. I'll be out in the mountains of West Virginia chasing some trout down there. So. God, it's interesting. And I, I kind of, I'm digging into this a little bit just because I'm curious about it. You know, your background, I have a friend who's a um, fire, was a fire investigator, Greg, and, you know, and he's doing some stuff now that he's just not super, right. It's not, he's talking about like, oh man, it's going to be great when he retires and gets out and is able to fish all the time. I mean, what was it, what's for you, you know, your line of work for 30 years, was it something where, you know, it was just, it was always, I guess, right. You're always hard to, you're taking that home with you kind of challenging. And it just seems for me, I'm always like on the outside thinking like, what would it be like to be a police officer? Is it, is it as hard as it sounds like to everybody? It, it, it can be challenging. Um, and, and certainly as, as time goes on, this profession is getting more and more difficult. Uh, you know, current events will, will show you that more, and more politics and stuff. Yeah. Far, far more. And a lot more negative attitude towards law enforcement officers. Uh, it is a very stressful career, uh, career, and that was one of the things that uh, fly fishing provided for me was a uh, a release and escape from that. And uh, so I fished very heavily throughout my my whole career. Uh, vacations were always planned around you know traveling to fly fish here or there, and uh, even even those short escapes on a, on a day off to a local trout stream or a local lake. And now again, we're one of these things where the warm water fly fishing came in is, you know, you can, after getting off work, I can either, you know, just stroll down to a neighborhood pond or, you know, throw a float tube or kayak in the back of the truck and, you know, be, be floating on the water in a totally different world, totally different environment in a very, very short period of time. So that was, was my release. escape. Absolutely. That's amazing. Yeah, I think for a lot of people, that's what it is. Yeah, no matter whether you're a police officer or whatever your line of work is, being able to escape and and get out of it. So, all right, Bart. Well, um, I'll let you. I'll let you get out of here. Uh, maybe just give us a heads up in the next year, whatever you know. Anything. I mean, the book is that the biggest thing you got coming in the next uh, year or two. Yeah, the book is a big one. Um, that's uh, that's going to occupy a lot of my time in the months to come for sure. Uh, there's going to be some some travel involved um, with that as well. I you know do there's a couple uh, fish species that I have not targeted yet because of where I live. So uh, oh really? What are those? Which ones well, are those? Um, yeah, specifically, one bucket list fish is not necessarily a member of the sunfish family, but it's the Rio Grande cichlid. And it's a very unique looking fish that, um, you know, calls the rivers around Round Rock, Texas, its home. And um, if you if you look up that fish, um, they're they're a wild looking fish. Uh, They got these big humpbacks and these uh, brilliantly speckled bodies. They're uh, run around the same size as most of our our sunfish species. Um, But they're they're very very cool looking fish and they are native fish they're native to uh to the southern united states uh, particularly texas and um i'm very interested in in our native uh fish species you know there are uh, a lot of little known or little pursued uh, bass species that that occupy a lot of our our southern rivers and some of these bass uh, like the red eye bass, coosa bass, they live in what would be a trout stream if it was in a more northern location. You know, you look at these streams and they're lined with rhododendrons, and you got co- cool, clean water running over boulders. And if if you were transplanted there and you had no idea what the water temperature was, you, you would swear that you were looking at a trout stream. But instead of trout, uh, you know, the rivers are are. You know, they have these populations of uh, bass and, and sunfish that um, are, are very unique to those particular ecosystems. So some of those fish are on the bucket list. Um, 
yeah, so I'm looking forward to it. It'll it's going to be a good experience. <clears throat> All right, Bart. Well, uh, thanks again, and we'll send everybody out to uh, panfishonthefly.com. And, uh, yeah, this has been great. I appreciate you digging in here and, and sharing some uh, some information. I'll, I'll definitely keep up with you on the book and help get the word out when that comes out. So, yeah, man, thanks again for taking the time. Fantastic, fantastic. It was great talking with you, Dave. Thank you. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes, all the links, everything else we covered today, head over to wetflyswing.com slash 265, 265 to grab all the links and everything we talked about. Reminder again, if you get a chance, please share this episode with another person who you think would love the information we had here today. That would be amazing. That would help us keep this uh, grassroots movement going on and going strong. Heads up uh, next week, if you get a chance, uh, if you haven't already, if you're new to the show, click that subscribe button. Uh, we've got uh, another episode with Phil Roy, the lake fishing master, guru, stillwater guru. We're, we're, we're backing up the gurus. And one more guru for you here. Pat Cohen was known in this show, episode 107. So if you go to wetflyswing.com slash 107, you can hear Pat Cohen uh, talk about uh, his his uh, deer poppers and all the, the cool deer stuff he has going on. So um, lots, of, lots of good content for you. I'd like to hear from you. I'd like to know if uh, two episodes a week is good or if you'd like to do, I'd like to hear three, if you could keep up with three. Send me a uh, link on social media or uh, DM or whatever, or send me an email, dave at wetflyswing.com. Let me know. I'd love to hear uh, if you'd love us to, dibble, uh, <laughs> to not to dibble down, to double down another one. Uh, that's it. That's all. I'm going to get out of here. I've got to get uh, back on the road. Thanks again, and thank you for your support. See ya. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.